Hey, I'm Todd Sharp, and this is my Oracle Code Online talk about how I automated my barn with Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Docker, Kubernetes, Micronaut, and much, much more, including Autonomous Database and some other cool things. Um, so thank you for joining me, and let's get into it. Uh, this is Oracle's safe harbor statement. The following is intended to outline our general product direction. It is intended for information purposes only and may not be incorporated in, into any contract. Here's our agenda today. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little about background and architecture. Then we're going to look at some code, including, including what I like to call the outgoing and incoming code flows. Um, then we're going to look at a little bit of motion sensing and persistence with autonomous transaction processing and some other cool things along the way. This is me. I am a full stack developer first and foremost. I use Groovy, Grails, TypeScript, uh, JavaScript, Node, and Angular. Started way back in the day with Cold Fusion back in 2004. And today I'm paid to be a cloud developer advocate for Oracle. And previously, I've worked at AT&T and a consulting firm called Booz Allen Hamilton. So I was born in the beautiful city of Cleveland, Ohio, back in the uh, 70s. And I grew up in that area. And around 2002, I moved to the suburbs to a town called Medina, Ohio. Lived there for about 12 years. And then my wife, kids, and I moved to the beautiful rural area uh, down in the northern part of Georgia in the uh, lower Appalachian Mountains and to a town called Blairsville, Georgia. When we moved to Blairsville, we did what a lot of people do, and we went and bought a barn with a pig and some chickens and built a little bit of a pasture and just kind of enjoyed the rural part of life. Uh, but it was then when we kind of quickly realized that uh, having a barn and a bunch of animals is, uh, is a lot of work. Uh, you have to get up every morning, make sure that the uh, barn is opened, make sure the animals have fresh water, make sure they're fed, clean bedding, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, ends up being quite a bit of work. And uh, so back when we built the barn, I kind of realized that, hey, this is something that I could automate. Um, I could do some kind of simple features with the Raspberry Pi and make my life a little bit easier. So I went and bought a Raspberry Pi and hooked up some sensors and door sensors and cameras and temperature sensors and things like that and did some kind of basic automation. Uh, I built a very simple web interface and uh, as I said, added a temperature sensor, uh, door sensor, RF outlet for controlling and scheduling, turning lights on and off, those kind of things, and uh, the ability to have a, a webcam stream. Uh, it was nice and uh, it was helpful and kind of helped me automate certain tasks, but uh, it was web-based. Uh, the web-based interface was local LAN only. So uh, among that and other shortcomings, um, I kind of realized that uh, I would like to kind of make a little bit of a better system um, so that I could have automated feeding, I could have data persistence so that I could uh, kind of check the history of the the doors being opened and closed, those sorts of things. Um, I thought it would be a good project to kind of revisit uh, when I became a developer advocate at Oracle and see what I could do to kind of take it to the next level. So I came up with what I call version two and um, I listed out some requirements that I wanted to have for version two. The first requirement was that I wanted it to be cloud-based. Obviously uh, being a cloud advocate uh, my first priority was to make sure that I could get something on the cloud with this system. I also wanted it to have a real-time web-based interface so that any of the sensor data that was read, I, I wanted that data to be pushed in real time to the browser. I wanted to add data persistence for trend analysis and potential machine learning so that I could store that data as opposed to just streaming it directly to the web interface I wanted to have it uh, that persistent data so that I can go back and look at that data uh, at, at another time. I wanted to add automated feeding and watering so that um, if I were to leave the house for the day and maybe uh, go down to Atlanta and spend the day down there, I wouldn't have to worry about rushing home to feed uh, or give the animals fresh water. I also wanted to add mechanized animal doors, again, so that if I had to leave early in the morning, uh, take a day trip somewhere, I'd be able to either schedule or remotely open and close those animal doors. 
which leads into the next final requirement. I wanted it to be able to be remotely controlled. So before we go into looking at the demo, uh, let's take a look at an overall architecture drawing here of the system that I came up with. And uh, the system that I've designed and, and created this time around, uh, I've actually done it as a kind of a, like a prototype. So uh, it's sitting right on my desk here so that I'm able to show you and demo these things to you, but it's not actually installed in my barn yet. Uh, all of the hardware and software that are connected to the system are certainly capable of handling the tasks that I'll demonstrate, but obviously the cost and the labor involved in, in doing a full-scale deployment would be a, a lot more involved. So uh, I created it as a prototype so that it's easy to demo and show you these things, um, but it's uh, obviously only a, a demonstration at this time. Uh, not that it makes it any less impressive. So uh, let's take a look at the architecture here. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the drawing here, we have our Arduino, and there's some analog and digital sensors connected to the Arduino. And the Arduino, I like to think of as the heart of the system. It's uh, without the Arduino, the entire system doesn't exist. It's kind of the source of all of most of the data uh, that gets produced into the system. Uh, the Arduino is connected to the Raspberry Pi via a serial connection uh, with USB, and the Raspberry Pi sits over here. Uh, it also has a sensor attached to it, as well as a web camera, so it has inputs as well. And the Raspberry Pi, I think of as like the brain of the system, right? It takes some of that data from the Arduino, uh, accepts it, and then kind of figures out what it needs to do with that data, uh, as well as receiving messages back from the front end and kind of put some logic around what it needs to do. In the middle here, we have a message queue. And this is uh, taken care of using uh, OCI streaming, which is Oracle Cloud Infrastructure's uh, kind of version of message queues. Uh, originally, I had this designed as a Kafka queue. And when the OCI streaming uh, product came online, I switched it over to that, and it's working really great. Uh, up here, we have the Docker container uh, deployed within a Kubernetes uh, cluster. And this is the Micronaut uh, microservice side of things. Uh, if I if I go back to the message queue and think of that as like a stomach, the uh, stomach kind of, what does a stomach do? It receives input and it produces output, right? So um, if the uh, message queue is the stomach, then I like to think of the microservice as the digestive system. Uh, it accepts that input from the message queue and uh, it does store some some fat, quote unquote, into the database, just like your digestive system kind of absorbs some nutrients out of the, uh, the input that it receives. Uh, so the Micronaut uh, microservice, I think of like the digestive system of, uh, part of the system. Uh, over here next to the Micronaut microservice, we have the Angular front end. And again, this is a Docker container deployed on Kubernetes. And I like to think of that as the skin, right? Uh, it's the part that everyone sees when they look at the system. So um, that's why I think of it as the skin. Down here in the uh, lower right hand corner, we have the autonomous transaction processing database. And um, that's the fat, right? So uh, any of that input that it receives from the microservice, it stores just like your body would store fat. Um, down here on the bottom here, we have some other things. We have uh, an object storage. Uh, so this is kind of like S3. Uh, this is Oracle's object storage. And uh, again, that's just kind of like the fat as well, right? It stores some residual data from the system. Um, cloud events are involved. They're not shown in this drawing, but I think of cloud events as like your ears. Um, so if I were to ask you to pick up a pencil off the desk, your ears would hear that, uh, right? And so our cloud events are listening for something. They're listening for an object storage event to happen. So when something is persisted to object storage, uh, that uh, cloud event will be dispatched and the cloud event is just there to listen for that. Um, down here in the bottom, we have FN and this is Oracle Functions uh, and that is a serverless portion of it. And I like to think of that as like the hands, right? So when your ears hear me ask you to pick up a pencil off a table, your hands will then do that, right? So in this case, uh, FN, the serverless function, uh, does something 
when the uh, cloud events hear uh, an event being broadcast. So the cloud uh, events broadcast an event and the serverless function does something. And we'll take a look at what that is a little bit later on. Uh, also not shown is cloud notifications. And I think of cloud notifications as the mouth. Um, so when the serverless function does something, the mouth goes and tells everybody that it did it. Okay, great. Let's move on to the demo. So for this demo, um, I've got a webcam here that is focused on my desk and the web interface over here on the right. So to just kind of show you real quick what's going on with the uh, demo, over here on the left is two water sources. The one on the left being a source and the one on the right would be illustrating a pet bowl, right? Um, so there's a water level sensor here that detects the water level and there's a pump here that will pump water from the source to the pet bowl. Um, so the point here being is that maybe the left bowl would represent a 55 gallon drum or even a water pipe that's connected up uh, to, a, to a valve that controls the flow. But uh, the water level sensor will detect when the pet has drank uh, enough water to kind of bring that level down where it needs to be filled up which would automatically trigger the pump to kick on and refill that. And we'll take a look at that later on. Uh, right here in the middle, we have a door built out of Legos. And this is a Lego motor here that drives the, uh, that drives a gear, which opens uh, via this rack on top of the door. So on demand, that door will be able to be open and closed. And over here, we have a, another door which is uh, the pig door, and this is a solenoid lock-driven door, so that uh, on demand I can open that solenoid and unlock that door, and the pig can take his snout and bump that door open and go on out. Also not shown here, uh, this gray case here is what contains all of the uh, sensors and all the hardware, and there's some other sensors in there as well as like uh, an ambient uh, light sensor, temperature sensor, those kind of things are all uh, encapsulated inside that uh, enclosure. So if we were to start up the system uh, and we do that by SSH uh, SSHing into the Raspberry Pi and then simply starting up a script uh, excuse me and in just a second that script will start up and it's going to start producing data uh, which will then uh, become available to our web interface. So it's going through, it's configuring things, adding listeners, those sorts of things, and now it's publishing messages, right? So now that we've started up our publisher on the Raspberry Pi, if we come over here to the web interface, we can see that we've already had, we already have data being populated. So the door zero, the door sensor is reporting it is in a closed state. Uh, door 1 also reports in a closed state. It's reporting that its light is off. Uh, the current temperature is 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees Celsius, and 15% humidity. Now if we minimize this uh, and scroll down a little bit here, we can see that in real time these charts are being updated. Uh, so the water level chart, you can see the, the water level every second or so is being updated as well as the temperature and humidity chart. Uh, the light level sensor here is also updating, and if we were to take our hand and cover the uh, light level sensor, we can see that that light level drops significantly. So it's reporting in real time the data directly to the web interface. We have motion capture down here, but before we get to that, let's take a look at uh, remotely controlling something. So let's say we wanted to turn our light on. We can come to the web interface, click the turn light on button, and uh, in just a few seconds here, you'll notice that the light over here on the webcam stream comes on immediately. Um, if we click the open button here, we'll see that the door uh, opens itself and we have our chicken ready to come out and uh, eat some breakfast. We can close that door and turn that light off and you'll also notice in the webcam video that that light gets 
uh, door gets closed and the light gets turned off. If we want to come down here and enable the pump, we can click the enable pump button and in just a few seconds you'll notice that the pump has been enabled and the water level starts to rise over here on the pet bowl. The water level is also being reported in real time to the web interface so we can see that rising. Now we're getting close to 100 milliliters in the pet jar and that will uh, shut off when it gets to uh, 150 milliliters just at, or actually I'm sorry, it shuts off at 100 milliliters uh, as a threshold. So uh, we can notice now that the pump has stopped running and we're all full uh, just above 100 milliliters. So we'll disable that pump just so it doesn't continue to run in the background uh, if it happens to empty. And essentially that's a demo of the system. If we wanted to unlock the pig door, we can click unlock and we'll notice that the solenoid over here uh, unlocks. And then uh, after about five, 10 seconds, it will relock itself. So that's the system and how it works. Now let's take a look at some of the code behind that system. So now that we've seen the demo of how my automated barn system works, let's take a look at some of the uh, code behind that system. And before we do that, uh, let's kind of look at an overview of what I like to call the outgoing flow. That is the flow of data from the barn to the web. The first piece of this, as we kind of talked about already, is that the Arduino will read a sensor, it'll format that data for output, and then it's going to print that data to a serial connection. The next step is the, that the Raspberry Pi will read the serial, parse that JSON, and then post it to an outgoing messaging queue. The microservice will consume that outgoing topic, persist data to ATP, and then emit events for potential event source endpoints. And the front end is going to establish an event source in JavaScript and consume those real-time server sent events from the microservice. So how about some code? The first piece I'll show here is the uh, Arduino piece. And the Arduino, uh, Arduinos are programmed in a slightly modified version of C++. Uh, and so that's what you see here is uh, some C++ code that's actually compiled down and, and published to the Arduino. And so here's an example of collecting temperature. We have a function that uses a DHT library that's included. And all it does is reads the pin uh, that I've connected the temperature sensor to and then returns that data. Down on line nine, we create an output buffer, uh, which is just a JSON object. And then we add some keys and nested objects. Uh, one key for the type of event that we're looking at and then another key for the data related to that event. So in this case, my data object has a Celsius, Fahrenheit, and humidity, humidity element, and those all compose the event, uh, the temperature event object that I'm creating here. Down on line 15, I just add this temporary object to a message array, which later on is what I'll use to print to serial. The next piece is the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi uses uh, it's, it's a, a groovy application that's compiled as a jar file and deployed to the Raspberry Pi and the jar just runs uh, all the time whenever I start it up and it continuously reads serial. So in this case we're uh, doing a sleep if there are no bytes available on the serial port otherwise we create a new byte array and we read all of the bytes from that serial connection into the byte array and then finally convert it to string. Uh, down on line eight, we parse that to text. Uh, I'm sorry, we parse that to JSON so that we're sure that we have an actual JSON object. And that's just to protect, about, protect against any cases where the serial data might not be a complete object. Maybe we've only read half of the message from the serial connection. And we just wanna make sure that we actually have an entire JSON object that's fully, uh, a fully valid JSON that we could eventually send on to our message queue. And down on line 14 is where we do that. We call our message producer, and then we send that, uh, that message that we read from serial, converting it back to JSON string, and sending it on. 
in the Raspberry Pi publisher side of things, uh, we use the OCI Java SDK, creating a message details object, uh, put message details object, and then we use a put message request to uh, take that string and publish that up to the message queue. So it's a real simple way to just put messages up onto that OCI streaming queue, just with a few lines of code. Now at this point in the process, I kind of realized I had a problem. On the microservice side of things, I wanted to be able to consume all events from a topic, even if there aren't any front end clients connected, right? So um, I wanted to have that data persistence for all of the events, as long as the Raspberry Pi was producing them. And I didn't want to wait until a front end client was connected to consume all those events. At the same time, I needed to push all of the events that the microservice did receive to any connected front end clients. So it kind of created this uh, little uh, situation where I want to always consume things, but I also want to always push things to connected clients. And the solution that I came up with was to use the observer pattern. So let's take a look at that. On the microservice side of things, we have a simple consumer that's created, again, using the OCI Java SDK. Uh, we create a cursor and a group cursor request and just pass some details along like the stream ID that we're using. Uh, we attach the cursor details to that create cursor request. And then finally, we create the cursor. On the right hand side over here, we just use a get message request builder and then we call get messages. So this is basically consuming all of the stream, the pending stream messages uh, on the stream, uh, the OCI stream. Down here, we'll loop over all of those. So uh, every message that we get, we get an array back. We're going to loop over that. We're going to use a JSON slurper to then convert that string that we have in our message back to JSON. Create a barn event down here. And this is just uh, a model object that contains the type and then the data related to that, as well as the timestamp. And down here on line 18, we have a slightly similar but slightly different barn SSE event. And this is what I'm going to use eventually to broadcast within our event bus that's going to tell our connected front end clients that we have something that they need to pass on. Down here on line 24, as long as we're not talking about a camera event, and I'll explain why we're ignoring those later on, we're gonna send on our barn event bus, we're gonna send that SSE event onto that uh, event bus. And then down on line 26, finally, we're using our Oracle data service to save the event. So this runs uh, constantly, and it's always going to consume all of the events pending on the uh, Oracle Cloud queue and save all of them, whether or not there's any front end clients connected, as well as, like I said on line 24, using an event bus to send uh, a message within the application for any potential front end clients. The event bus looks like this using Rx Java. It's just a simple publish subject object, uh, which uh, with the send method calling on next to the event bus and uh, then a two observable function down on line 12. And that is consumed on the HTTP endpoint side of things, which uh, uses uh, service and events to publish that eventually to uh, any connected clients. Now the microservice, as I said, is a micro not uh, application. And so this is a simple get method within my barn controller which uh, has a endpoint of slash stream. And uh, on line five here, we just create an initial event state. Line six, we have a generator, uh, which uh, is what's actually going to be called every time uh, the service and event produces something. So down on line eight, we use our barn event bus and we subscribe to that event bus and every single time the barn event bus uh, subscribe method is called, or every time it receives a message, uh, it will call the emitter.onNext function. And this is what actually broadcasts the service and event to the connected clients. Finally, on line 26, we just uh, return that publisher that 
uh, we created to, uh, to the end endpoint. Back to our architecture drawing, what that looks like in motion is uh, kind of like this. The sensors up here will pass, uh, will be read by the Arduino, which pass the sensor data onto the Raspberry Pi, which sends a message to the message queue, finally is consumed by the Micronaut microservice, sends the data to the front end, as well as persisting it into the Oracle database. Let's take a look now at the data flow for the incoming flow. And what uh, the incoming flow is data going from the web to the barn. So in this flow, we're talking about user inputs, right? Button presses, link clicks, those sorts of things. And when uh, the user does any of those input things, uh, we're gonna post that data to the microservice using Angular. The microservice will, uh, when it receives that post, it's going to post a message to a messaging queue incoming topic. The Raspberry Pi is going to consume that incoming topic. And if it needs to, it's going to write to the serial connection upon incoming message. And the Arduino will receive incoming messages and, performing, and perform a task. So from the code side of things, on the front end, the Angular uh, application has, for example, a control door function. And when I want to open a door, I simply pass the door number, either zero or one, and whether or not I want to open or close the door as a Boolean. So uh, on line four through nine, we just have a switch three through nine, we have a switch case, which determines which door we're talking about. On line 11, we use a data service to send a control message, which is an Arduino message containing the uh, type of event, whether uh, you know we have a door event or a water event, a light event, those kind of things. And then finally, the message. What do we want to, the Arduino to do regarding that element? So it's going to either open a door or turn on a pump or turn on a light, those kind of things. So I craft this Arduino message and then using the data service down on line, line 19, we just make a simple HTTP post to the barn control endpoint passing along the message. On the Micronaut side of things, it's a very simple endpoint. All it is is a uh, post endpoint that consumes and produces JSON, receives that Arduino message in the body, and uses a message producer to send that message on to the incoming queue. On the Raspberry Pi side of things, the code looks very similar to the consumer on the Micronaut side of things. Just a create a cursor, we create a cursor, uh, we create a uh, get request, and then we start consuming that incoming queue. Uh, over here on line seven, the thing to note here is that in this case, instead of using a, uh, a service to publish it to the, uh, the front end via a server send event, we're using our Arduino service to send that on to the Arduino. And the, uh, this, this is how we accomplish sending to the Arduino. Uh, simply convert the message to JSON and then using a that same serial library to write those bytes to the serial port. And on the Arduino side of things, to read the incoming messages, we simply read that serial and then we determine on this side of things what we need to do with it. So we do a switch case which has multiple different cases for the different types of uh, possible incoming events. In this case, for example, we have door one and door zero, which we can then take and either activate a motor or unlock a solenoid. The flow of that looks like this when in motion. We have data user input from the front end to the microservice, posting to the incoming queue, which is consumed by the Raspberry Pi, sends data along to the Arduino, which sends data to control messages to sensors or motors or solenoids uh, attached to the Arduino. The next thing we'll take a look at is motion, motion sensing image capture. A motion sensor is connected and runs on the Raspberry Pi and uh, the Groovy script that runs on the Pi 
We'll actually create an event listener for motion events via a library called Pi4j. And uh, when that event motion event is captured, we're going to uh, take a snapshot whenever that event is triggered. When that happens, we're going to upload that snapshot to Oracle Cloud Object Storage. We're going to use the Amazon S3 API for that, believe it or not. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. When the object is persisted to object storage, it's going to trigger a cloud event. The cloud event is going to trigger, trigger a serverless function. And the serverless function is going to anal analyze that image for predators and then send a notification uh, to my mobile phone if it detects any predators. Finally, we're going to send a message to the messaging queue to notify of image capture. And earlier I mentioned that there's a separate stream for the camera events. And the reason for that is uh, I've created several different incoming and outgoing uh, clients using different languages and frameworks. And uh, I want those different languages and frameworks to all consume the same incoming and outgoing events in kind of a distributed fashion. So um, my event queue is partitioned so that different clients can consume from the same event and kind of distribute that load. When it comes to camera events, I want those to go to every connected client so that uh, if I'm running it either in Node or in Groovy or Micronaut, I want all of those to receive that camera event and not just uh, a partitioned kind of distributed events. Uh, so that's the reason why there's a separate stream for camera messages. So the code for the Raspberry Pi uh, that attaches the event listener is really simple. We just have a GPI GPIO service uh, and a motion sensor, and we just attach a listener to that using a GPIO, GPIO pin listener digital. And then we have a handle uh, state change event method, which is called every time the uh, event is triggered. So in this case, our motion sensor, uh, if it's entering a state of high, meaning that the motion sensor has turned on, we're going to take a picture and then store that and then broadcast a message. Uh, we ignore the pin state low event because that just means that our motion sensor is turning off. So we don't want to take any action when that happens. So the snap, taking a snapshot and then storing it in object storage code kind of looks like this. Uh, on the left hand side here, we just simply take a snapshot using a, uh, a function that I'm not showing here. Uh, it basically uses a uh, built-in Raspberry Pi uh, library to take that image and store it to a file. Um, then we're going to call on line 4 the store method, which is what's shown on the right over here. And if you've done any work with the Amazon S3 API, this code should look really familiar to you. And uh, that's because it is. It is the Amazon S3 API. We create an object metadata object. Uh, we add metadata to it. Uh, then we create a put object request. We tell it what bucket, what the key is, and then pass it the file. Finally, we use the S3 client put object method and pass the put object request along to the client. Uh, and the really cool thing about this is that Oracle Object Storage has a fully compliant Amazon S3 endpoint, which lets you plug and play with the Amazon S3, I, S3 API. So if you have any existing code that you've taken uh, advantage of the S3 API and you want to migrate that over to Oracle Cloud, it's really easy to do. It's just a matter of changing the endpoint that you're pointing at and you're ready to go. So jumping back over to the left hand side, uh, we use our message producer to send a message uh, to the camera stream, letting, uh, letting it know that a camera event has been captured. The next step here is setting up a cloud event to fire when a new object is persisted in the bucket and call the serverless function. So this is done uh, a couple of different ways. The way I'm showing here is through the uh, cloud console UI. We just create a display name, uh, give the cloud event a display name and a description. And then we basically tell it what kind of event we're looking for here. So there's different types of events. Uh, in this case, we want the object storage create object event type. 
Um, we limit that to a specific bucket so that we're not listening to every single bucket within uh, object storage. And then on the bottom here, we tell it what kind of action we want it to take when it uh, fires that, when that cloud event is fired. So in this case, we want it to call a serverless function. So we tell it the action, action type of functions. We choose the compartment that our function exists in and then pass the function ID uh, for the actual function itself that we want to call. The serverless function is uh, a simple, simple uh, groovy function that's uh, deployed to Oracle functions. And the first thing that we're going to see here is that it receives a JSON object containing event details. So we're going to parse that into an object. Uh, on the second line here, we're going to then take some of that data from the parsed event and construct an image URL, which is pointing to the actual image in object storage. So we're going to take the namespace, the bucket name, and the display name and construct that URL. Uh, the next step is to use the Clarify third-party API, and we're going to use that to analyze the image using their API. And that's done down on this line where we call clarifyclient.predict. And then we tell it what image we want it to use as input, and then we're going to execute that. So the Clarify API is going to take our image, it's going to analyze it, and it's going to return us a list of concepts. And we loop over those concepts, and these are just the actual kind of concepts that it uh, has extracted from our image. We're going to create a message on the last line here, which is a concatenation of all of those concepts. And then we're going to use, again, the OCI Java SDK to send a notification using the notification data plane client. Our message details is going to simply be uh, con contain the message that we used of all those concepts that we concatenated. And then we're going to publish that message. So the Oracle Cloud Notification Service uh, has the ability to notify different types of endpoints. And currently supported our PagerDuty endpoints as well as email endpoints. In my case, I've used a little bit of a hack and uh, actually set up an endpoint subscription uh, with an email address that is actually my mobile phone uh, email address. So most mobile providers have a mobile phone that can be used to send SMS messages to a phone. And I've just taken that phone number and subscribed to that notification topic with that phone number, with that email address. So any notifications that are published to that particular topic will get sent to my mobile phone as a SMS message. And so that flow looks kind of like this. User input from the front end uh, to take a snapshot and the microservice sends that message to the queue. The Raspberry Pi reads that queue and says, hey, I need to take a picture. Uh, the other way is the motion sensor detects an event and then sends that to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi takes the picture, sends it to object storage, which calls the serverless function via cloud events, which sends the message to my mobile as an SMS. So let's take a look at a demo of the image capture capabilities within the system. As we can see here, this is the Angular front end and in the bottom right hand corner here we have the motion capture pod and as we can see that there are no images available and down on the bottom right we have this take snap snapshot button and if we were to click on that take snapshot button uh, we will uh, initiate the process and let's review that process so what happens here is um, as opposed to when the motion capture uh, detects motion in this case we've initiated a user input on the front end which will call the microservice, posting a message to the microservice. The microservice will then take and um, send a message to the messaging queue incoming topic uh, that the Raspberry Pi will then consume. When the Raspberry Pi consumes that message, it will say, okay, I need to take a snapshot, and it will do that, and it will save it to object storage. And as you can see here, 
uh, then send an outgoing message letting us know that the image is available and getting pushed directly to the front end. Um, we just see a digital photo frame here on my desk that I'm using to simulate some random pictures. Um, and so what happens here is after the image is uploaded, the object storage um, cloud event is triggered, which calls the serverless function. And the serverless function takes and calls that clarify API, uh, which does the image recognition. And as you can see here, sends me a text message with the identified uh, topics and also gives me a link to view the image directly if I wanted to do that. Uh, so that's uh, essentially the image capture uh, feature of the demo. In this section, we're going to take a look at persistence and how that's accomplished using Oracle Autonomous Database. Uh, as I said before, the persistence for this uh, application uses Oracle Autonomous Transaction Processing which is uh, Oracle's cloud uh, self-driving cloud service database. Um, the uh, really nice thing about uh, persistence is that we can store JSON data in a traditional database table. So uh, instead of using a traditional NoSQL type uh, solution, we use JSON in the database and that JSON data can be queried. So we can kind of treat it just like we would treat normal JSON uh, data, normal data in a database. Uh, and taking a look at how that's accomplished, we can see that in this example, we have select star from barn event BE, where BE.data.Fahrenheit is greater than 75. So looking down on line nine, we can see that the data is actually stored in, in a table we have ID captured at in type columns, and then we have this data column which stores our JSON data. And the really awesome thing about that is that we don't have to create a separate table for all the different types of events within the system. So I don't have to worry about a light table and a water table all having different columns for the different types of data that we may be getting. Uh, in this case, we can just set all of the data as a JSON uh, object right into that data column and uh, be able to query that and filter that and do anything we need to do with that data directly from native SQL that we're already familiar with and already comfortable with. Uh, so we, again, we don't have to switch to any type of like no SQL solution uh, to accomplish this functionality. So to summarize, I like to use personal problems when I'm learning new tech. Um, and try to think about non-traditional usages of tools and services. So um, maybe using JSON data inside a uh, traditional RDBMS or things like that. Um, you know, try to leverage kind of new ways of thinking uh, just to give you that uh, ability to learn that technology in, in a way that really sticks in your mind. Uh, message streaming and queues are awesome. This is really the first experience that I've had using them and they're really helpful. Um, complex problems do not require complex solutions, right? So um, while I'm not solving world hunger here, it's still pretty cool that I'm able to get live temperature data from my office to the browser in real time, pretty much from anywhere within the world. So, um, you know, and, and the fact that I can do all that with some, some simple technology and some simple hardware and some, uh, some frameworks and language uh, choices is, is pretty awesome. So, um, again, complex problems, just they don't have to require a complex solution. You can kind of simplify things. Um, architectures with different languages and dependencies and frameworks can all work together really easily. Uh, so as I've said, I've, I've made a node client. I have Groovy clients, Micronaut clients, uh, microservices in different languages. And they all work together really, really nicely, really easily. Uh, I've deployed in Kubernetes, so everything can talk to each other uh, really easily and um, it's a great way if you have a team that that knows different languages and frameworks uh, to get your entire architecture to work together it is really not that complex um, real-time data push is possible with server sent events so uh, to be able to take that data from the microservice and push it directly to the browser uh, is really simple with server sent events and uh, you know it doesn't have to be difficult you don't have to dip down to web sockets or anything like that. So um, real-time data is, uh, is certainly possible. 
you can store JSON documents in a traditional RDBMS. So as we just looked at, you can take that. You don't have to utilize any Mongo APIs. You can use the traditional uh, SQL that, that you're comfortable with, that you're familiar with, that you've maybe been using for years, and uh, store that JSON document directly in that system that you're, that you're used to working with uh, without really anything. Here's my contact info. You can uh, check out my blog, recursive.codes. Find me on Twitter. Uh, I also blog quite a bit at the Oracle Developers blog. And you can email me, todd.sharp at oracle.com. I uh, look forward to hearing from you. Here's some of the resources that are used with this demo and in this presentation. Pi4j, the source code for all of my demos is on GitHub. The information for Oracle ATP, the jserial.com used for serial uh, reading and writing as well as information about the Oracle Cloud, Oracle Cloud infrastructure containers. So again, thank you for joining me for how I automated my barn with all of these cloud native technologies. I hope that uh, it was helpful to you and I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. Thanks a lot.